Good morning. Uh, I cordially uh, welcome all of you on behalf of Shaw Network and Delta Metropolis Association to the second edition of uh, Next Generation Podium for Euro Delta. Uh, we are on the fifth day of the uh, fourth day of the symposium, and uh, it's a five day long event that we are hosting. And today we are in, at the opening ceremony of the working conference. So we have two hours of uh, opening today, and then the participants get to work and uh, get uh, give us some good ideas, innovative ideas about how to work on a mega region. I'm Alankrita Sarkar, a spatial planner and project leader from Delta Metropolis Association. And uh, I would actually already want to get in Paul Keretson. He's the director of uh, Delta Metropolis Association, and uh, we will do the moderation together. So. It would be better if you can already say hi and then we say hey good morning everyone um so my voice is a little bit weak still um i'm, I'm just recovering from uh, from uh, uh, COVID actually so um, i hope my voice will hold so that's why Anakrita and me will uh, chair this uh, meeting this morning together um and i'm really looking forward to uh well, kicking off the real work, I, uh, I would say, because I think that's what we're about to do, the real work, working on the Euro Delta. <clears throat> uh, so a big thank you to the whole consortia first, uh, um, who can make this happen. City of Amsterdam, The Hague, uh, Province of South Holland, Delta Metropolis Association and uh, Brown Urban. We have been working since last six months to uh, do the second edition of next generation podium but we have already done it once uh, last year that was the pilot year and we were successfully organizing it paul do you want to say something from last year how was your feeling and what new do you expect this year well i think the uh, last year um, gave us the enthusiasm eh, that this was actually uh, uh, an idea uh, worth pursuing for um, well, at least a number of years. So let's see where we end up with how this grows. And uh, I have to say uh, already from the lunch forum, uh, which I watched online, uh, I can tell you that uh, for me, it was uh, really in, in, indeed uh, a good choice that we decided to do it again. And we will probably uh, in the coming years keep doing this. Um, since this interaction in the Euro Delta is really fundamental and um, we require the inputs of the universities and schools in the big challenges that we have in this, uh, in, in this uh, uh, Euro Delta. So um, I think it was a wise choice to, uh, to become enthusiastic about the results of last year and to to go for it again. And I'm really very looking forward to what uh, brings the coming two days in terms of, uh, of, the, of the work by the next generation. So probably some uh, quick house rules. Uh, this is a two hour session, the opening ceremony, and we will really try to be on time. So to all the speakers, let's try to stick to our uh, short presentations and more interaction. Uh, everybody is already muted, I see, so that's a good sign, so we don't disturb any speaker in between. The chat box is open. If you have any questions, any queries, any technical issues, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we always have somebody answering there, so that would be, um, your questions will be answered. And uh, last thing, please note that we are recording the session and we will be pick taking some photos and screenshots in between. So. If you are not comfortable with that, please switch off your uh, video, but otherwise we would really love to see all of your faces. Um, great. So with the fourth day, Paul, already you mentioned quickly about uh, what we did last three uh, days. It was three lunch forums focused and into the themes, three themes that we are looking into, water management and climate adaptation cross-border mobility and uh, infrastructure. And the third theme is special, uh, 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 smart specialization strategies. So what are what did you learn probably before asking going to the participants what they learned? What did you learn from these? 
Well, yeah, I, I have to say, uh, like I said already, it was uh, for me very inspiring to, to have these insights. Eh? So um, these are very different topics, three very different topics. Um, so the question is what binds them, but also what binds them to the Euro Delta and why would we need to work on it on this scale? And for me, in each of the three sessions, it became very apparent through these presentations uh, why it's so relevant. Of course, water management and climate adaptation, as you could say, is the easy one. Uh, we're in a delta, uh, it's the Euro Delta, um, and we have to cope with the uh, monumentous change that is happening all around us. Uh, we uh, almost have to deal with it uh, on a daily or weekly basis. So I think this is has become uh, increasingly clear. Cross-border mobility, you could say likewise. Eh? Um, the Euro has for centuries been of course, uh, the uh, important uh, trading point in the, in the, in the European uh, hemisphere. Logically, there's always a big uh, issue focusing on cross-border mobility um, and trying to change that. And then the smart specialization, well, it's an ugly word, I, uh, I always think, like what is it really, you think? But I think the lunch for of yesterday really showed how fundamental it is to rethink our economy. It's really on the basis of how we operate and what we feel as a role in terms of um, the structure and, uh, and, and, and what kind of emphasis that uh, could have. So for me, it became very apparent that these three topics have um, very direct meaning uh, in, uh, in the Euro Delta. It has the relevance of scale, I think. We need big plans. We need to think big. Uh, it has the relevance for territory. It, there's a spatial dimension to all of these elements. Uh, it's really a very important thing. I think. And it has the relevance of collaboration. So we need each other in order to cope with this. So I think, um, well, of course, all of these presentations that we saw were very insightful, taken up by different sides. Eh? So very interesting to see that we also need to have this collaboration between uh, the governments, uh, uh, the businesses, uh, but also the design element to it eh? in, in each of these lunch for and there was definitely very clearly a role of design. So if this is all so well and good in place, like why do we need the next generation, you could ask yourself. Well, and I think also all of these lunch for us show that there is a big importance and need for uh, the next generation to, to think about these, uh, these, these issues. Uh, because these problems that were described are very persistent. Eh? We've not managed to come up with uh, solutions, uh, however wealthy, however well organized, how, you know, it's really, um, it requires more than what is brought to the table. And these problems for sure require, therefore, a fresh perspective, uh, another way of looking at them. Uh, and new ideas, and particularly also new uh, ways to convey them. I found it very interesting to see that there was so much um, use of uh, short videos, uh, like from uh, communication uh, offices, very refined, uh, to, uh, to talk to uh, perhaps our politicians or uh, a more general audience to convey a message. But I'm thinking that actually we need new images, we need new creativity and other ways of looking at them. So no stock images, no uh, nicely, neatly drawn uh, figurettes uh, doing uh, certain things. No, we need real new ideas. And that's what I'm really hoping for uh, from the next generation and uh, this next generation podium in the coming two days. So I'm really very much looking forward and how things can also be rethought and really uh, give in that sense a spark. Uh, so probably it's already change. good to mention like 
what you are pointing out to the um, to the participants that we are not talking about any refined images or any refined videos, but really the core idea to as a solution, but a good um, way of uh, presentation, a good way of representing the idea. How to yeah, use your creativity, come come use each other's creativity, inspire one another, work, uh, collaborate come up with new uh, images, uh, new visuals that really spark a debate. Um, we don't have to draw neatly within the lines, uh, let's say. Great, that's a good inspiring statement to start with. Uh, let's quickly look into the program for today and then we start inviting our speakers for today. We are, as I mentioned, we are on the fourth day of the symposium and uh, today we will be having probably one core presentation from the Shore Network talking about what has been done till now and what we look forward to do. Uh, we will have our keynote speaker Sandra Pedekrom uh, and then there are two studios being presented to show what kind of collaboration can happen between uh, academia and practice and some research projects to pitch the ideas to uh, between uh, the practitioners uh, and how the practitioners can work together with uh, the researchers at a variety of universities. We take a pause at 11 o'clock with uh, the coffee break and there we stop for the viewers uh, of opening ceremony and uh, we get back to the uh, participants after the break with working more on the project with further supervision. Some of the practitioners will be supervising the students uh, to develop their uh, ideas and images. And um, that's how we end for the day. And then for, uh, for all the viewers, we invite all of you again for tomorrow at the closing ceremony. So this is how we are doing today. I think last few days, but also since today morning, last 15 minutes, we talked a lot about Euro Delta or the mega region. Uh, Paul, what is your idea that how many people actually understand Euro Delta? Oh, ah, uh, good question. Do I understand? Do we, uh, yeah. That's the question. That's maybe also a good question. No, let's let's uh, let's do a poll. Okay, let's. Uh, Why see. not? Yeah, sure. So I think it should be coming into all of your screens. How much do you understand Euro Delta? Oh, uh, it's nice to see that people are really ready to contribute. <laughs> Most of them are saying that. Great, uh, quite good results till now. Ready to contribute. Well, that's yes. what we're here for. Um, so that's, uh, but also still confused and having some questions, but there's more than enough time also to interact with each other and um, come up with answers for questions. So, yeah, um, well, maybe it's, um, um, maybe it's, uh, it's good to introduce our first speaker. Yes. Uh, since uh, he might also help a little bit still with the ones who are still confused. Um, <laughs> since what is this Euro Delta actually, uh, Helmut? Um, and what is the Sure Network? Perhaps you can also say something about, uh, about that. Uh, Helmut uh, very welcome uh, this morning. Um, senior policy developer at the province of South Holland and one of the founding fathers, I can say, and big inspirators for uh, the Sure Euro Delta and uh, also a long time collaborator. Uh, so Helmut, um, very good that you're here. You're an urban designer and also an advocate of research by design in large scale transition challenges. So I think that's what we're exactly here for. So I'm very happy you're here and I'm very happy that you might sort of get the confused a little bit up to speed um, still uh, this morning. So, uh, But it's actually yours. not bad that uh, around 60% uh, 
uh, of the audience here are actually ready to contribute. So we are looking forward to the contributions from them, but also we want to add in the another 40% in there and uh, Helmut help us doing that. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to share my screen first. You, you can hear me, I uh, suppose. Yeah. Uh, this one. Can you see the presentation? Mm, yes, uh, probably the full screen no. would be better. It's not yet any full screen. Oh, on my, uh, on my laptop is full screen. Um, better now? Yes. Okay. So thanks for having me and um, yes, I, uh, also, and I think most of the members of the SURE network would have uh, a hard time to answer the three questions. Everyone is still confused. Everyone is trying to understand what we're doing and everyone is ready to contribute. So we're at the beginning of understanding um, what the area is and we are building a network. And I would like to tell you something about that, who we are, what we want and a lot of what we don't know yet and where we uh, are very happy that you uh, would like to help us and to contribute um, on our way, on our journey through this uh, area. Uh, I want to do it by addressing uh, um, common challenges and uh, how we want to collaborate and sharing expertise with our network. And it's all about what was also mentioned already by Alan Krita and Paul. It's about new images, new ideas and uh, maps, but most of all narratives which uh, bind uh, people, most, uh, most important of all. Um, does this work? Yes. Um, I want to start by uh, slightly introducing also this theme of mega regions, which is uh, uh, um, a, uh, quite recent urban uh, new phenomenon. Uh, globally, you see these kind of powerhouses. Uh, oh, this is, the, it is also a subject of research and analysis and debate. And when you look at the global map, you see these uh, mega regions um, uh, on every part of the globe, kind of new powerhouses. Um, and when, when you look at the European uh, map and you also especially look at the Euro Delta, one of the first things you see is that the Euro Delta uh, and all its systems are a lot of uh, crossing borders, which is um, a very important issue. It's also an uh, opportunity, but also a big challenge in the way we organize this. Um, I really love this photo and see the sun coming up from the east on the Euro Delta. It's also a very um, well known um, aerial image. This one, um, if you zoom in, the Euro Delta lights up from space. Um, and if you also look and on a geographical map, it's also, of course, um, uh, a pattern of urban uh, settlement, which is very intense for European um, standards, and it's polycentric. So it's a, a huge uh, challenge also to, to connect the dots and to connect people and infrastructure. This is a map uh, how you can also draw it. It was uh, uh, done by Richard Florida. And if you do the countings on all these European mega regions, you might see that the Euro Delta although we cannot really um, take a, a, a draw a border around it, it's approximately 3% of the EU surface, but it has 10% of the EU gross domestic products and 12% of its inhabitants. So it's really a huge kind of core in the European uh, geography. Um, this image at the same time, if you look back the last 30 years and you, you see and analyze what the European Union has done and has also done with a lot of good reasons um, is to invest a lot of structural funding uh, into the new members and to the borders of the European Union. Um, and what you might also ask yourself is that in the same time, uh, what happened to the core areas in all the mega regions uh, we saw on the map before? So did we care uh, enough for core? Um, and there are a lot of uh, new challenges, societal challenges. Um, they are stacking up. We have uh, COVID, we have recessions, uh, huge climate change uh, and biodiversity, biodiversity challenge. And unfortunately, we have also apparently the return of geopolitics. So um, 
we came from um, a period where we had the Brexit, uh, we had uh, China and uh, the United States uh, um, in, a, in a new uh, geopolitical struggle. But now, of course, with the Ukraine, um, there's a lot of new uh, discussions about uh, working together in Europe um, and uh, globally. And this has big, huge implications on infrastructure, energy supplies, and so on. If you look at the map also, you see that um, the narrative for the Euro data is really a, an open question. What we found out quite uh, fast is that the Euro data is almost the only cross-border metropolitan region in Europe without a strategy yet. And seeing the, all these uh, challenges, you might say, oh, how can this be? And this is exactly the point um, where the Shure network wanted to make a beginning and a start. Uh, working towards the strategy, we have a roadmap developed by that, um, and we are addressing common challenges, and we want to build a network driven by collaboration and sharing expertise. So what we do, what we started is looking what's there. Of course, there's a lot of uh, work done already in the Eurodelta, uh, especially scientific networks. They don't know these borders. Uh, they work perfectly. Um, the flows of transport, planes, uh, ships, uh, trains, this all works uh, regardless of the borders, but it could be improved, of course, always. And what we also see that the last, let's say, 50 years, there was not too much work done on this area. Um, beginning in the, uh, 2000, there was some work by OMA, the Office of Ram Colas, which uh, had some work published about the Holocaust and which also mapped, of course, the common grounds of culture, trade, language, and governance uh, of this area, but also pointed out the uh, weaker spots of it um, and the demographic challenges and the pollution challenges. And of course, if you look and you map uh, further, you see that we are, of course, interlinked uh, in this area with uh, um, huge uh, economic flows. And which is also, of course, on the base of the delta is the, the, the river basins of Rhine, Meuse, Schelt, and Ems. So we share a lot of uh, infrastructure on different levels. Uh, lovely image on the left, uh, the bike lanes in the Euro Delta, a high density map, which shows that the enormous success and uh, uh, the activities of um, um, urban uh, regions. We have energy infrastructure cross border, we have high speed networks. So there's a lot we share. And so what we do as a sure network, we say, okay, the, the um, mega region Euro data, it is there. It is matching also the UCD definition of a mega region. So we want to work with it. Um, although there's a, a dilemma where the economy is scaling up, up, up and governance seems to scale down, down, down. A lot of societal questions are actually taken up by cities and mega region at this time. Sometimes we miss also the national uh, level a bit in this, but um, we want to start as a, as a network of regions and cities with um, uh, uh, the work and um, the strategic urban region Eurodelta that the Schur network um, is um, a platform for the exchange of knowledge. And we want to explore new ways to achieve um, the harmonious economic, social, and territorial development in the area. So this is a map of the partners. Um, it's a growing network. Uh, it has uh, different circles. And um, we are always, of course, uh, open to do the next step with even more partners. It's a growing. Uh, we have a mission statement. So we, the Eurodata is a matter of fact, and we um, embrace it as a new and relevant scale for cooperation, research, planning, policy making, and of course, design, also Paul mentioned this. Um, we are embedded in, uh, of course, in uh, different frameworks. We will uh, hear from the uh, SDGs, uh, soon from Sandra Pellegrom. Uh, we are uh, also contributing to the European Green Deal, very important, and a uh, new European Bauhaus was also already present in this. Uh, um, sure, it's about network and territory. We are uh, a network, also organization, and we have a roadmap where we want to um, um, envision uh, a journey where we want to end up in maybe in the, in the future, but we are really at the beginning and, and at the 
moment we are informal and informal networks. So um, I want to end with showing some um, uh, images of also our design and research and design work because um, an aspect of our network. So we started by uh, looking closer into this uh, mega region um, um, and compare us with other regions uh, in the US and in uh, Asia. And we started, of course, with uh, mapping the water, the energy network, the um, infrastructure things. And these are the, really the common challenges we are addressing our water system. So we also want to take this as an opportunity to uh, organize collaboration. Uh, so we are drawing maps uh, like this. We are also um, drawing maps of infrastructure, pollution, addressing um, uh, networks on every level. Uh, also the knowledge networks, um, mapping themes, also in spite, of course, always by earlier works for this is an example of the International Architecture Biennale in Rotterdam, which is about metabolism, also a way of drawing maps. In also in 2014, already the scale of the other, other rivers was addressed. And these beautiful maps about flows of different uh, things, food, energy, water, sand, air, but most of all people. And these are the last slides. Of course, we analyzed uh, the network, we analyzed um, the transport flow. So a lot of work also on the ground to do. But um, it's a mixture of experimenting, of drawing new opportunities. For example, this is what might be, what might be a very beautiful future. Uh, Amsterdam, uh, Brussels, um, Cologne, if you really improve it, you could have uh, within two hours, you could have such a beautiful map of connecting a lot of people. Um, and this has to be continued. Um, we are still working, we're still, uh, uh, we really love to have your ideas with it. Um, and this is where I would like to stop. Um, giving back the word to uh, Alan Krita. I think Alan Krita is frozen at the moment. I don't know. Uh, she, she will come back uh, probably uh, in a minute. Um, but uh, perhaps uh, there are some issues. Let me, let me uh, I think, for, uh, for your slides, giving a little bit of, um, of clarity, but also showing that there is really a lot of room for new work, new ideas. So I think that was also very relevant what you showed. Um, <clears throat> it's not only about the large scale of the mega region, but it's also about the relevance on the ground and how these things. I think uh, Hank Bauman made a point in the chat, uh, which is maybe interesting also to pick up on. Uh, he said, um, yes, uh, very powerful region, but also one of the most uh, poll polluted areas in, in Europe. Um, is this, uh, uh, in your perspective, uh, uh, enough known? Uh, yeah, it's, it's strange. It's also, um, I saw it always in the maps of OMA, um, a very um, uh, two-sided um, image of the metropole because uh, also, when 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 I started to look at it, it the area is not the the most loved and successful area in in Europe. I mean, if you want to compare it with Copenhagen or Munich or some other cities, of course, um, it is less polluted, less crowded, less chaotic. Um, but still, there's also the other side. So we we know, of course, that there's a lot of industry, a lot of people, a lot of uh, transport. So it has uh, pollution. But um, there's always these, these, these two sides of it. But of course, we have a, a serious uh, a challenge. But it is also connected uh, to, to the way the area is developed and organized. Yeah. No, I think indeed it's good that, uh, that uh, Hank mentions this. Um, and I think, um, well, there's now more questions in the chat, but perhaps it's nice to pick that up uh, uh, later at the end of the morning uh, when there are still some room for uh, for discussions about uh, how how to collaborate, how to uh, come forward. Alain Krita, you're back. Yes, uh, sorry, I missed out last couple of minutes, but uh, I'm back now. Probably, Helmut, what you were saying about the challenges, uh, maybe just answering to Fabio's question could be nice because he's asking that how do we compare with other mega regions, these challenges or um, the key findings, like is there any criteria, particular criteria that we compare with other uh, mega regions or? Yeah, I understand this also uh, first instinct, you always want to benchmark, but to my knowledge, we are looking more on the positive sides now and how we are connected, how many people, how many GDP, how many, uh, what's the topography. But um, 
I, to my knowledge, there's no not a good overview on the societal challenges every mega region has, or especially on the themes um, we are looking on now, um, we are, which are also very important for the future and the next generation, and for the new images, ideas, maps, and narratives we know. But I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm, I would be personally very interested to see what is happening in China on this yeah. kind of issues, what's happening in the States. We have a very classical way of drawing our uh, maps, so I have not a good answer on this, but um, yeah. I think it's a very good question. <laughs> Paul, if I'm not mistaken, a few years back, we did this study a little bit with other mega regions, but yes, definitely we did not look into the societal challenges, but more in terms of the infrastructure or geographical discussion. So the similarities and comparisons on those notes. But uh, I think the societal part, but also Frank de Hont is mentioning about the political side, that could be quite interesting as well to see these two sides yeah. of it. Yes. Well, and I think one element is, is mentioned in Helmut's presentation, and that is that the, the fact of the mega region is already a big, uh, important difference. Um, since we're um, so used to focus on our national borders, particularly in terms of planning and looking forward, it's very much driven on the national level at the moment. We tend to forget that there's actually something outside the borderline when we draw a map. And therefore, I think already establishing the idea that actually this is an area where uh, this condition of the mega region is very apparent uh, has be been very important in the last couple of years. So in terms of comparison with other mega regions in the rest of the world, the fact that we have this mega region in four countries or maybe even five countries uh, instead of in one country, I think make a, makes a big difference. So we tend to forget this context uh, in each and every single country. So I think that is already a and very important element uh, yeah. also stated in the mission statement of the Sure Network. So I think the relevance of that cannot be overstated. But um, yeah, let's uh, let's uh, get the questions rolling in the chat box and we pick it up at the end with all the speakers on board. But uh, on that note, Paul, uh, I think it's time to move to our next topic and we create a connection between how can Shore Network address UN SDGs? Yes, well, so indeed. So thank you very much, Helmut, for now. You will be back in the program and uh, coming up uh, here and there for sure. And it's very interesting also that you showed the SDGs uh, as, uh, as uh, one of the frameworks in which this work needs to be done, because I think uh, particularly when I speak about the Netherlands, because I know it quite uh, well, actually, that the context, uh, uh, for example, in our own uh, uh, national environmental vision, uh, but perhaps also in other countries in the Euro Delta, the SDGs don't seem to be so relevant sometimes. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I would say, uh, how come? Huh? Sustainable development goals are uh, something for the world. And how come it feels that in the Netherlands these don't seem to be too relevant? Uh, I know for sure that the, the National Environmental Vision uh, only at the last moment decided, oh yeah, perhaps we need to make a reference to our uh, SDGs. Well, wait, where's the picture? Let's put it in. But that's not what it, how it works. And I think also the lunch fora have shown us that uh, we don't have it under control. We don't have many of the problems underlying these goals under control. Very often, uh, perhaps without knowing it, but sometimes knowing full well, we're also origin of many of the problems underlying these, uh, these goals. So I'm very, very happy that we have as a keynote speaker, uh, Sandra Pellegrom, welcome. Um, uh, she is the Dutch national sustainable development goals coordinator um, and uh, you've worked uh, for the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs for a long time uh, all over the world uh, in, in many different positions um, and I, I'm really very happy that you're here to uh, enlighten us 
to make us understand why this is so fundamental to really uh, put these uh, SDGs at the core of our thinking. Uh, you've been um, a coordinator uh, for a couple of years, and I'm really also curious how you see this change, or if you agree with me, or perhaps you disagree with me, uh, about how we uh, look at it uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands and in, uh, in the Euro Delta. So please, uh, somehow the floor is, uh, is yours. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I was uh, shaking my head when you said that about the National Environmental uh, Framework, because I know the person who wrote it and uh, he has been uh, using the SDGs to write this program from the start. So <laughs> it's actually one of the one of the examples where the SDGs were used in, de in designing policy from uh, from the get go. And he's doing the same now when he's uh, uh, working out the um, uh, the, the plan further for the next edition. Um, yeah, so my name is Sandra Pellegrom. I'm the national coordinator for the SDGs in the Netherlands. Paul uh, rightly indicated that I'm based in the Foreign Affairs Ministry, but my task is actually directed at a national implementation of the goals. So I work a lot with other ministries and I work a lot with um, all kinds of different parties in society to encourage using the SDGs as a tool and as a compass to uh, to work sustainably. Um, and I think, you know, when they asked me to speak in this conference, I said, but I'm really not an expert on city planning, on adaptation, on all the issues that you are discussing in terms of uh, mega region, Euro Delta. Um, but, you know, the good th news is I, I am actually, I do know quite a lot about sustainability. And um, well, Paul was quite clear that he said, you know, I don't have a solution. I have to disappoint you, I don't have the solutions either, but I think that looking at sustainability and the sustainable development goals will help us to be inspired and to have a framework that will help us find these new ways that you, Paul, were encouraging us to, uh, to find. Um, and I think sustainability, we're talking about the next generation here, we're talking to the next generation and with the next generation here. I think when the next generation takes our places, sustainability will be the new normal. It will be the standard. There is no other way. I'm firmly convinced that the only way to safeguard human well-being and prosperity for the future, especially also in mega cities, in a mega region, is to act sustainably. And to do so from a wide perspective, sustainable in the sense of respecting the planet, respecting the people, um, and respecting our society, the way that we cooperate and are together uh, in this. <clears throat> so what I wanted to do is to tell you a little bit more today about the Sustainable Development Goals, um, then get a little bit into why are they so unique, unique and, and uh, how you can use them also to future-proof your plans and your, uh, your work. So let me start by what are the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, for those who are not very familiar with them, let me share my screen. And hold on. Yes, is this clear? This, these are the, the, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and what I sometimes think is that people, when they see these goals, they think, oh, but that's obvious, you know, they kind of dismiss them because they're like, yeah, obviously we need to achieve these goals. I mean, it's logical, right? And I mean, it also sometimes seems a little bit when you start with no poverty, no hunger, it seems like something for mostly developing countries. But this is not true. It's a very unique and special um, agenda um, that really speaks to all of us. And I... Um, I want to tell you a little bit on how I sort of got to that point myself. When I was, when the, the, the Sustainable Development Goals were uh, going to be adopted in New York in September 2015, they had of course been negotiated for a number of years between uh, UN member states. And I'd heard about it, I'd read about it, you know, for me it was the, the goals that were going to succeed, the Millennium Development Goals, and it all seemed very logical. And I'd seen these, you know, these goals in a list and they seemed, you know, very relevant for development, but not very special. But then when we were preparing, um, there's always a week in New York in September when the UN opens its General Assembly. Um, and 
every state leader, uh, head of government, head of state uh, from around the globe comes to New York to that specific week. And that was also the week that the, the first SDG summit was going to be held when the SDGs were going to be adopted. Um, and I had just started working in our mission uh, in New York with the UN, our Dutch mission. And one of the tasks, huge task for us was to receive all these VIPs, all these ministers, the prime minister, the king from the Netherlands, and to uh, prepare the program for them. Um, and you think that's very much about the content? Uh, well, let me tell you, it's mostly about the logistics. And one of the things that we, we always did is we got a tour a couple of these days before all these principles uh, would arrive, a tour through the UN building in order to understand what areas were going to be closed off, uh, for what areas you need special passes, all the regular um, routes through the building were going to be different. So we always had a tour to sort of understand uh, so that, you know, if for instance, I would have to guide Prime Minister Rutte through the building the next week, then I would know where to go and what kind of passes I needed. And during that tour, at some point we arrived at the balcony overlooking the, the big room, the big hall where the uh, all 193 member states usually sit. The hall was empty at that point, um, but there was a tiny little group of people on the stage. And I think you've seen the hall on TV. It's a beautiful hall with you know, with the, the logo of the UN in gold in the back. And it's, it's a very impressive hall. And there was a tiny little group of people on the stage underneath that logo, and they were making music. And of course we stopped, we wanted to see what was happening, but I could see that the person who was guiding us through the building was being uh, signaled from another security person down there, like take these people away from here. They're not allowed to be here. And we, she was trying to get us out and we said, no, no, we want to listen. And she said, no, no, you can't. This is like a surprise performance that is going to be held at the opening of the SDG summit and you're not supposed to see it. And of course we stuck around and we didn't let her take us out because the singer just started to sing. And it was one of those moments that, you know, I still get goosebumps when I'm thinking about it. Beautiful sounds came on and Shakira started to sing. She was standing down there, Shakira. She started to sing Imagine by John Lennon. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. And for the SDGs, you know, this was really the surprise of the UN to launch the SDGs. So that inspired me when I got back to my office, I said, I really have to read these goals, you know? What is so special about them that we get, you know, Shakira singing Imagine to, to launch them. And when I started reading the goals, I understood that, you know, it's not just these pictures. It's a really, there's a lot of layers underneath it. And when you read the, um, it's called the preamble, those the, like the two pages where the, the countries of the world state why they adopt these goals. It's really about moving to a systems change, moving towards a new way of safeguarding human well-being for the future, making sure that we balance the well-being of people with the well-being of the planet, with prosperity, and with striving for peace and justice and human rights around the world. All of that is in the Sustainable Development Goals. And it's, in that sense, a very unique agenda. Um, myself, I have negotiated in the UN uh, a few resolutions. That is not easy. And it's very, very difficult to get above a certain, you know, lowest, lowest common denominator. And here we are with a set of 17 very ambitious goals that we have adopted globally with all 193 member states of the UN. And we've set ourselves a target, very ambitious, to reach them by 2030. 2030, because we know that by that time, we need to have started this change towards a more sustainable world. Uh, because we are reaching tipping points by 2030 that, uh, run, that make us run the risk of, of, of having unavoidable consequences if we don't act. Um, and the fact that all 193 heads of state and government of the world could not only imagine such a world, uh, but also commit to it, that I think is really special and indeed imagine. So this is why the goals are so special. Then, of course, the next question is, uh, how, can you, how can you use them yourself? Um, and I think one of the um, 
Yeah, my second point is really that the, the goals are all about connection. And that's why I think they're so relevant also for your work because a mega city, the Euro Delta, it's all about connection. And for me, the sustainable development goals are an inspiration to see how you can strengthen these connections in a sustainable manner. You can see that the sustainable development goals themselves are fully interconnected. Uh, they bring together different agendas that the UN has agreed in the past. Um, first of all, it's a continuation of the Millennium Goals, and these are really about basic human needs. Of course, we often think that this is only about developing countries, but in a mega region, I'm sure that we, if we look at the figures, we will see that, especially in big cities, that's where most of the, the poor also in our developed region uh, live. And I think in the Netherlands, but also in other countries, perhaps, we have recently through news and, and uh, affairs that happened, really seen that poverty is still alive also in our uh, very prosperous society. Inequalities is also growing in our very prosperous society. And I think uh, these goals still remain very relevant for us. If we talk about zero hunger, it's not just about um, not dying of hunger, it is about good quality, healthy, sustainable types of food that are accessible to people, also to people with, le with uh, little means. So these goals, these basic human needs that are in the Millennium Development Goals, they're still valid. But in the SDGs, we have also, of course, uh, integrated the, the so-called Rio process, uh, which was really about safeguarding the planet and restoring the health of the ecosystems that we are dependent on. And you can see there's several other elements of UN agendas in the SDGs. It's really about human rights. It's about uh, um, making sure that people uh, can live a life in dignity and respect. And it has a lot of elements of other agreements on biodiversity, on disaster risk reduction and resilience, and of course, uh, it relates very much also to the Paris Agreement of 2015. So the SDGs are really about bringing together all these agendas because we know that we need to connect these goals. An important uh, recognition in the SDGs is that one goal cannot be achieved in the long run without also achieving the other goals. We've seen that human development, we can promote it, we can increase it, but at some point, it runs into the, the, the planetary boundaries. And if we don't approach these things in connection with each other, there is a limit to how far we can promote human, uh, human well-being and human development. And I think especially in cities and in something like the mega region, uh, you see this in practice. You see that there, are, there is no way to avoid dealing with all these goals at the same time you have to in order to make it uh, sustainable for, your, for the future. It's also positive, it offers a lot of opportunities. I'll just quickly show you this uh, slide. Um, this slide really indicates how these SDGs link uh, together. And in the, um, in the community, we call this the SDG wedding cake. Uh, and you can see it has a, a little bit of a connection with the donut economy as well. So I'm not sure why we always choose these, uh, uh, these metaphors of things uh, sweet and, um, and nice, but you can see that uh, we're staying in bakery terms. This wedding cake really gives you a very good uh, idea how these goals interrelate. You can see that if you want to build a prosperous economy, and that's the top layer, you will need to build it on a healthy society, um, a thriving society where people, all people, uh, can play a role and no one is left behind. And in order to build that society, we need healthy ecosystems and sustainable approaches uh, for the future. So all these goals are interlinked. And um, as I said, the one cannot uh, be achieved without the other. And again, what is so interesting about the SDGs is that they really say, don't look at these uh, goals from a, a, a silo perspective but look at them from a systems perspective and uh, make this the basis of how you approach your work also in city planning and uh, working on the Delta uh, and so on and so forth. 
And just for the, um, I, in the Netherlands at least, there's a, a quite a lot of interest uh, nowadays in a concept called a brede welvaart, um, the well-being economy. And the nice thing is that uh, well-being economy and the SDGs are very, very closely um, connected because uh, from our perspective, the SDGs really offer a way to, to fill the concept of a well-being economy with concrete long-term goals. Um, and in the, the Netherlands, our statistics office uh, publishes every year um, uh, a report uh, on where we stand in the Netherlands, both on the well-being economy and on the SDGs. They've integrated these two indicator sets and they're showing how these two concepts really uh, connect to each other. Um, and the value of the well-being concept is that it links to underlying concepts in the SDGs that are not explicit, but that are there. Um, meaning that if we are striving for well being and prosperity in the here and now, in the present, so in our specific location, in our mega region, we can only do so with a view also to how it influences well being and prosperity for later generations and how it influences well-being and prosperity for people elsewhere in the world. So this perspective of look at your well-being here and now, but in connection to people elsewhere, in, in connection to later generations, that is very much also uh, what the SDGs are trying to help you to do. Now, the third and final point I wanted to make is that this is not easy, of course. It's a, uh, sorry, um, one more thing. I wanted to show you the opportunities. This is a very complicated slide, but I think um, you can understand it. I've uh, uh, taken out the, um, I've put the, the arrow with the SDG 11, which is about uh, sustainable, uh, healthy, resilient communities and cities. But this table shows you what the interlinkages between different goals are. Um, and there's a percept perception very often that, uh, yes, of course, it's all fine and well that you want to achieve all these goals together and that you, you need to invest in all of them, but we can because there's trade-offs and there's less budget and it's very difficult um, and there's no way that you can achieve all these goals. But this narrative of always looking at trade-offs, I think it's wrong and this slide shows you why because it shows you all the different relations between the different goals and the blue parts of these circles are where the goals have a positive relation to each other. The orange parts are where there are trade-offs and possible negative relations to each other. But you can see that the potential for positive relations between these uh, um, goals, positive interlinkages is way bigger than the potential trade-offs. So let's keep a positive mind. And if people tell you that, oh, you know, you want to connect different goals, but you have to choose because there's always trade-offs, don't immediately believe them. Think deeper and try to search uh, for all these positive connections that are, are there. But then of course, as I said, um, sorry, and this is, yeah, just a, a, a quick overview of how you can um, envision that for the work that you are doing on sustainable cities and communities, how they interlink to so many other different goals. And it immediately brings me to the, the third uh, and final point. It's not easy. If you look at this slide, you can see that, yes, of course, it's all relevant, but so many things that are all interconnecting, that are all relevant to each other. How do you deal with uh, with that? How do you find these connections and how do you use them? It's not an easy thing uh, to do. Um, but I do think, as I said, it's the only way forward and it's the only way to uh, design uh, truly sustainable policies and approaches with each other. And what I think, um, and we're all searching here, there's no, there's no clear answer, there's no specific method that has been developed that gives you the answer and the solution uh, to make these connections. It's still something you all need to do yourself and that we all need to do together. Um, it's, it's not, there is no clear answer, you have to search for it. But the SDGs, in my firm belief, will provide a good compass and an instrument to inspire you to do so. And what I think we first need to do is understand 
linkages between goals. So when we are designing policies and approaches, let's first try and allow ourselves a wide view of all the different issues that are relevant. And let's see if we can understand what the linkages are between these goals. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting work ongoing uh, that will help you. More and more scientific work is looking at these interlinkages um, and more and more uh, scientific agencies are also trying to translate that in um, you know, policy advice. And I think a couple of interesting examples in the Netherlands, for instance, were that our uh, planning agency for environment, the PBL, has recently done um, a study where they've looked at a set of different possible measures you can take for climate mitigation and how they link to different other SDG goals. Uh, what are the positive linkages? So that means that you know, certain measures can strengthen other goals as well. And what are the potential trade-offs? So that's a very interesting study. And the, the Dutch Statistics Agency has done the same thing uh, with regard to circular economy and how does it relate to other SDG goals. So there's more and more information available that will help you get, gain insights, but you still need to do the, uh, the designing yourself. Um, and as I said, it also offers a lot of opportunities. Um, when goals interlink, of course, there's an opportunity for smart investing in multiple goals at the same time. The second thing I think we need to do, and um, I think Paul was already referring to it, new ways of thinking, new ways of doing. Um, yesterday's approaches, of course, are not going to, to help us to, uh, to get out of our silos and to try to find uh, approaches that link different goals. Uh, so I'd really encourage you, if, for instance, in your studies, uh, you encounter, you know, um, theories that are still very much uh, yesterday's theories, challenge, challenge your teachers, have this conversation together, um, but try to think out of the box and try to uh, uh, look towards the future and, and do not get bogged down in, oh, we cannot do this, it's too difficult because you might be using the approaches of yesterday or, or the approaches of today. If the approaches of today are not helping us to do this, connecting these different goals, maybe we need to work on the approaches of tomorrow. And that I think is what I would encourage you um, uh, to do. Look for future oriented options and use the SDG lens to encourage you to do this, to challenge yourself and each other uh, to identify these synergies and to redefine also the way we look at costs and budgets. If we look at costs more in a wider sense, nearly always it is uh, in the long run more beneficial and a better cost benefit uh, if, you, if you combine different goals together. Um, and interestingly, you see also in uh, the scientific world, but also in the UN, for instance, that more and more this is being recognized. The UN recently last year launched uh, a new uh, set of uh, natural capital indicators for organizations and for governments to use uh, and are encouraging governments to do so. So this is really a changing field. And I think in your work on the mega cities, try to be in the front of that curve with your, um, with your thinking and also in the scientific uh, um, information that you uh, use. Um, and then finally, the biggest challenge I think that we are facing if we want to um, work from a connecting perspective is that we face urgency. A lot of the challenges that cities and that uh, deltas face are urgent. Uh, as I said, 2030 uh, is the deadline for the SDGs and it's coming rapidly, it's very close. So I think the challenge that we're facing all together um, is really to... Um, to address urgency and complexity at the same time. We need speed in so many areas, but we also need to stand still sometimes and think before we act. And this I think is really uh, a challenge that we need to recognize and that we consciously need to keep in mind when we are uh, making decisions and designing and moving forward. forward. Uh, and I know we all know this African proverb that goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. 
if you want to go far, go together. I think that is another challenge because in order to have these integrated approaches, we will also have to work integratedly and work together with many different parties. Um, so how do you also do that? Go fast, but go together. Um, so we, we need to get out of all the standard ways of thinking and um, yeah, do things in a, in a different way. So in conclusion, a next generation, uh, I, uh, I think the next generation really, I would encourage you to think outside of the box, to innovate, and use the SDGs and the power of the connection in the SDGs to push you towards more integrated, sustainable and inclusive solutions. Search for synergies with many different parties. Um, again, an old saying goes, great minds think alike. I don't agree. I think great minds think differently, but they think together. So search for these unexpected uh, 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 partners that think differently and that bring different things to the table because that is what we need in order to innovate to these new solutions that we cannot see uh, at the present yet. Um, and I think that will also help you to tilt your perspective. If you run into a problem and you think, oh, how do we, how do, we do this? All these different things we want to achieve, we can't tilt your perspective and see if you can come up with something new that does make it possible. And then finally, avoid tunnel vision. Um, I think we do need to make speed. So it's sometimes very uh, attractive or you know, there's a temptation to, to go for a very focused specific uh, goal, for instance, on mobility or for instance, on poverty um, or on climate mitigation. But try to challenge yourself not to use the tunnel because I always say that you know, the tunnel doesn't necessarily bring you to the, the, the most beautiful place. Um, and even though the road along the mountain might be winding and a little bit longer, I think you can still make speed on that road. And at least you keep on seeing what goes on around you and what you might be able to use to achieve your goals. So don't fall into the trap of tunnel vision. Use the SDGs to help give you this wider perspective um, and use them as a compass and an inspiration to try and find these solutions that are created and that are owned and that are uh, are used by the next generation in order to, uh, to achieve all these different goals uh, in a way that will safeguard well-being of all people in the megacities, in the Euro Delta, and around the world for the future. Thank you. Well, uh, now I need to stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Sanna, uh, for your inspiring talk, urgency and complexity at the same time. I think that uh, really inspires us to, uh, to, to uh, get going with our work. Um, but um, I think we have, Alan Grita, some room for a couple of uh, remarks that were made in the chat. I think it's yes. worthwhile to, uh, to, to discuss that a little bit further. Um, and uh, I think it's also very good that you emphasize all of these ways of working with the, um, with the SDGs. And perhaps we can go a little bit further in, in that. Frank de Holt, for instance, asked, should we not translate the goals uh, to the Euro Delta scale? Like, I can imagine that that would help. Or is there something there already? Like, can you break them down a little bit towards what a certain area should cater for and, uh, and, and have that clear, clear cut on the table. Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly, the goals are global, of course. So uh, what, what you would like countries, uh, regions, cities, organizations, companies to do is take the goals and translate them uh, to link them to your core, uh, your core business, your core model. Um, and what we see, for instance, in a lot of cities is that they take the SDGs, and of course, I, I challenge you to achieve them all, but we have to recognize that you do need to prioritize, but in your priorities, keep the linkages to these other goals in order to make sure that you don't uh, damage them and that you don't, um, don't miss out on opportunities to, to link them. Um, so most, I think it would be a great idea to translate them specifically to the the challenges and the needs of the Euro, uh, the Euro Delta, of the mega region. Yeah. Um, 
And I think that would also be um, uh, an, a possibility to have this narrative that you that you are searching for. Um, maybe as an inspiration, what we have done at the national level in the Netherlands is we've recently produced, and it still needs to be published, it will be published in June, but we've written our, um, our report to the UN on how we're doing on the SDGs. We do that every five years. So this is a big one. Um, and we said, how do we link the SDGs, these 17 goals to what is the political priority and what is the, the thing that people understand that we are working on in the Netherlands? So we've grouped these SDGs together in six major transitions that we are working on. Mm -hmm. And this is also something that the UN advises countries to do. Um, uh, UN asks a, a panel of experts every five, four years to produce a scientific report. And that scientific report of 2019 says to countries, take these SDGs together in a number of big transitions where they all coalesce. So that might be an, an idea for the Euro region uh, and then you're thinking of, you know, we, we picked um, a fair climate and energy transition, uh, sustainable agriculture and a, a healthy food system, inclusive society with equal opportunities. So there's different ways you can frame it, but where a number of SDGs come together in a number of these uh, big transitions, that might be a way to, to do it. Yeah. No, I, I think, think it's, uh, Paul, it's also interesting what Sandra mentioned, because we always talk about integrating and getting out of silos, but I think it's very well point to remember that we don't damage other uh, other SDGs, whom, which ones we are not prioritizing. So while working on or while integrating, we always should think that if not prominently working on supposedly SDG 5, we should not ruin it in any way. So what are the impacts of our projects or the integration or the systemic change that we are bringing in? What, uh, what, is, it, what is it that uh, it's bringing in in our project or in the priorities, but also what kind of effect, positive or negative, it has in the others? So the evaluation is, I think, uh, quite necessary. And, and for inspiration, I would like to mention also that we are presenting our report to the UN uh, in July, and it will be published in June. But the Dutch um, Association of Municipalities is also making a review to the UN on how local governments and decentralized governments in the Netherlands have been working with the SDGs over the past five years. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I think that might also be a very interesting report because uh, many different cities and municipalities are searching on how to use the SDGs to, to get to more integrated policy making on all these challenges that you have also recognized in your meeting. Yeah, no, it's very interesting to see how these, how these, uh, uh, how, how such a framework can be put into action. I think indeed uh, the wedding cake that you showed is, is very insightful, uh, but I'm also very much looking forward to the report, understanding the relationship to the transition. I know, for, for instance, one uh, example uh, for the international, uh, the, the Rotterdam International Architecture Biennale, who used them uh, in relationship to uh, a neighborhood in Rotterdam and the, and the change there, uh, work by Ouse. I think it's also very inspiring. He breaks it down into skill level. What does it mean for a person? for its uh, neighborhood, uh, for its position in the city, and relates all of these to, uh, uh, to these uh, SDGs. Um, perhaps you could say something to the students in, in maybe in, in terms of technique. Is there techniques of, of, of um, being sure to include them? As should, 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 uh, they, we, we will work in, in, uh, in teams of different students coming from different universities working together. Should you address, for instance, an SDG to everyone, or how 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 can you how can you work with them? There there is no specific uh, technique, but I think what the SDGs always encourage you to do is to to get out of your silos, um, and and that's the interesting thing, right? Because you do need to focus on specific goals, but keep that wider look. So I think if you assign specific SDGs to uh, to every student, uh, there should always be some challenge to connect to each other and to look at each other's goals as well or to you know to see how they uh, how they interrelate 
Uh, you can do that in pairs of two goals and see how they interrelate, in pairs of three goals, see how they interrelate. There's many different ways of doing it, but um, I think my encouragement would be to always look for the connection and the interrelation. Great. Well, yes, indeed, you started with that. They're all about connection. Uh, so uh, I think that's a big uh, inspiration for, uh, for all of us. Uh, thank you very much, Sandra, for your inspiring talk. Uh, I, I will try to answer some of the other questions in the chat that are still out there. Uh, yes, yes please, because indeed we're running out of time. I think Alan Krita is looking at the, at the watch at the moment. So uh, perhaps Alan Krita, we should continue with the next uh, part. Uh, Sandra, thank you so much for joining. I know that you have to leave a bit uh, early before 11. So if you can answer the questions, that's perfect. Otherwise, we pick this up in the panel discussion anyhow. Great. Thank you so much. Paul, I think it's time that we move to the next part that uh, talks about the collaboration between academy and practice. So as sure principles, we always try to connect practice, academy and research, but there are already some good inspirational ways of working that are, that has been taken up by variety of universities. So I would like to invite already our next speaker, uh, Christian Nolf, as well as uh, uh, Chule. Uh, Christian Nolf is joining us from uh, Wageningen University. He's an assistant professor there. And uh, Chule would be presenting next uh, from TU Delft. She's also Prof, uh, assistant professor in urbanism. So uh, Christian, the floor is yours. And just a quick uh, note, please uh, let's try to be on time so that we can have a good discussion at the end. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Alan Krita, for and, and everyone for uh, having us. So my name is Christian Nolf. I'm in fact from Belgium, so part of the, the, the Delta Metropole, but I'm just back back from seven years uh, living and working in China in the Yangtze River Delta, which is another mega city region. So I was very interested in this discussion of uh, comparing different urban regions. So today I will present uh, the work of students in the Master of Landscape Architecture at Wageningen University. It's in fact a quite short studio of eight weeks um, during which we looked at one part of the Netherlands. Uh, the, in, it's really like the northern edge of, of the Delta Metropole. And um, it's oops, sorry. It was a quite small group. Um, usually, we have about thirty students for this uh, studio. But in this case, we only had fifteen. We were three teachers, including my colleagues Sven Stremke, uh, Salin Verhoeven as a guest professor, myself, and Igor Stirnik as teaching assistant. And fifteen students you see here in the picture, including uh, five or oh, four uh, foreigners from China, from Hungary and from um, Malta, who's, uh, I think, following us. So that's the purpose of uh, this studio is also to bring uh, international perspective on the regional challenges in the Netherlands. We focused on the Kop van Noord-Holland, which you can see here on this picture, uh, which is somehow the gateway to the Wadden Sea, but also a, a region which faces a number of issues. It used to be a very important uh, harbor and, and pivotal, uh, pivotal place in the Netherlands. Um, its landscape also uh, shows that it has been a place of dynamic uh, in interaction between the sea and land and uh, land reclamation. And all of this uh, rich history is still visible in its landscape um, with traces of uh, the sea dynamics, the polders, the military history. Uh, also now new challenges emerging are related to the coastal defense, with interesting experiments on how to use more nature-based solutions. So overall here, um, this region uh, has many resources and also very intense activities, but there's a lack of integration and regional identity. So this is what we try to address during eight weeks with the students. Uh, like very visible on this, this picture is how you see how, how all these uh, different activities are just juxtaposed and don't really integrate. So the question the studio addresses is how can the monofunctional landscapes of this area be regenerated toward a strong and renewed future identity? So to investigate this, this uh, question, we selected an area of about 162 square kilometers. Um, and starting from the existing, 
uh, students were asked to uh, design a healthy living environment and a layered cultural landscape by means of three main interventions. The first one is to introduce a nitrogen buffer because of the intensive land, uh, agricultural activity. There are pollution issues uh, that can be addressed with new buffers. A second one is to reactivate at least one of the layers of cultural heritage. And a third uh, assignment is to design new, new uh, housing, new urban enclaves. And um, the first part, students um, investigated, uh, studied the area, they analyzed it from different perspectives, um, from water, demography, soils, which helped to understand that this region um, has a number of challenges. Uh, for instance, it's one of the least um, developing area in the Netherlands with an aging population, uh, less job opportunities than elsewhere, but it also has many resources. Um, like uh, particularly its cultural heritage that has been not really um, valorized somehow. Another part of the studio was a field trip and having the occasion to, to visit the site, but also to meet the, the local actors, the local experts, uh, or some people like here, we see a, a bulb flower farmer who develops a new alternative a uh, more sustainable way to develop this, uh, this agriculture. So I think this is also uh, quite interesting is the way the studio helps to really touch the ground. Uh, and then the students had to produce individually a vision. So a special concept for the entire area, a regional landscape design and a site design. And all of this should be done from a systemic design approach, which we also tend to call the Wageningen way of uh, planning and designing, which is about really understanding the systems, putting them, making them visible, trying to couple the different programs, uh, propose responsive and dynamic solutions, and also catalytic interventions that trigger development. So I, I will not have the time to uh, present all the, the projects. Also, by the way, the students are very busy now uh, producing their final report. They presented it two days ago, and now um, some of them are connected, but they were not able to present themselves. So we tried to um, group by theme some of the results. Um, this is one idea um, from Cornell, uh, who starts from the geography, trying to see how this region, if we zoom out, can get uh, maybe uh, more legibility. And his idea is to uh, rediscover the original island uh, essence of this area and to make it the, somehow the gateway or the uh, antichambre, the antichamber to the famous um, TVT, uh, uh, these this, this, this different islands um, on, the, on the Dutch coast. So by reopening um, the polder and all, really creating this experience of accessing the Den Helder as an island. Uh, uh, another type of project started more from the landscape dynamics, trying to uh, really understand how these mechanisms are working and how they can be encouraged by different technical means to consolidate the, the, the coast. You see here this very nice cross section which captures sand, sediments, uh, also adapts the type of agriculture to the more saline um, water resources. A third group looks at um, what the landscape characteristics and how um, this could be um, the starting point in order also to uh, um, reinforce the DNA of this region. This, this work from Carol, for instance, looks at the, the landscape as an overlap of two contrasting logics. You have on the right, the rational one, which uh, um, is about all the, the main direction of the polders, uh, the, the canals and the roads. And then another one, which is, which is transversal and um, interconnects the smaller elements and uh, how these two logics can be also uh, a way to organize the different programs. Uh, you, you have some large scale elements to implement for new energy, which could fit in this rational landscape, while the more uh, exploratory programs for housing uh, recreation would fit more into the, the smaller scale east-west one. Here also the idea of accentuating the historical landscape, how this um, pattern can be intensified and in order to organize the new uh, different programs that must be implemented um, in specific areas of transition where these different logics overlap, how they also 
can be um, dramatized and made more visible. A fourth group looks at really starting from the new programs that need to be made to make this area more sustainable. Uh, one project here looks at renewable energy and how the beach uh, and the coastal landscape can become um, really um, a, a, a big facility to um, um, store this energy using um, what he calls hydro energy storage towers, but that, that could at the same time capture sand and consolidate in a natural way the coastal um, system. Or here, how the different activities taking place uh, throughout the different seasons could be better syn synergized. Uh, the region now so somehow suffers from too many tourists in the summer, uh, uh, less activity in the rest of the year. So how the different land uses and the different activities could be um, better integrated uh, or how the question of living there could also um, take advantage of the water, which is present um, in new ways of living with the water. And the last group looks uh, at how to reconnect uh, the, and integrate the different parts. Um, here you see how the coast on the eastern side is now very like made out of heavy infrastructure could be reopened to reopen the dialogue with the water and sea, uh, make room for water, uh, for nature also um, at, at different scales. So this was a very, very quick overview of our students' work. Um, maybe some conclusion. Um, I was uh, also asked to reflect on how studios can bring new knowledge for the practitioners and decision makers and what kind of challenges can be overcome if research, academia, and practice can be connected in special planning sector. So I think what makes a studio uh, very specific is that we, we don't have really a client and also no budget uh, limitations. So um, it really opens possibilities to, to think um, out of the box, as, as it was said, and think of innovative ideas. Also to be connected to, uh, to the reality, to visit the site, to talk to the local uh, stakeholders and actors. Um, and regarding our specific studio, uh, the fact to connect um, research and design to work at, across different scales and uh, to base the, the, the spatial analysis and project on landscape systems as opposed to administrative boundaries, I think um, may help um, promoting a systemic understanding of the regional landscape and therefore inform decision making for land use um, in a way that is more connected to the physical reality and challenges. And also it's, it would help um, to, um, understanding the, so to understand these key processes and driving forces from the landscape can somehow depoliticize decision-making in the sense that uh, it should, uh, of course, I think it sh should still be politicized, uh, uh, but better uh, related to the physical uh, reality of the challenges. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, I'm happy to take questions if they are. Thank you so much, Christian. I see questions already coming in. Uh, probably we can pick up this one question and then move to the next presentation. And uh, we see, so uh, could you elaborate on nitrogen buffers? Can this help for nitrogen that enters the Euro Delta from the seaside? Yes, so this is like a very hot topic uh, at this moment. I, I would, um, I'm not a, 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 an expert, I'm more into water management. I would recommend you the work of Professor Marta Bakker, who's a, a, like a, a leading figure in that regard. As essentially, it's to um, integrate uh, buffer zones between intensive agriculture and the, the most vulnerable areas. And these buffers can, of course, play a role to, to filter um, water and, and get rid of nitrogen, but are a new opportunity to uh, combine with recreational networks, for instance. So that's a whole new uh, special assignment that, that is very exciting. Thank you so much, Christian. We have you again at the end uh, with the panel. Uh, mm -hmm. I would move to the next presentation and uh, ask uh, Chile to share your screen and uh, start with your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alan Kamita. Uh, is this full screen now? Yes. It's yes, okay. Uh, thank you for having me here. 
I'm very glad to share our experiences of a regional design studio at Steel Delft. Uh, with this short presentation, uh, I will briefly introduce students' work, but the main message here is to provide some inspirations um, how university design studios can contribute to societal debates on sustainable development uh, at the regional level. Um, this studio is part of a course called Spatial Strategies for the Global Metropolis. It is a part of the compulsory uh, uh, curriculum for the urbanism master students in their first year education. And the time is around uh, April, uh, from February to April. Actually, we just uh, finished the last round. Um, we every year have uh, around 80 to 90 students. Uh, a little bit half of the students are Dutch, and then the rest are international students. Um, we have uh, a studio, uh, which takes about two thirds of their time, and then another uh, one third of the time uh, is dedicated to a um, uh, methodology course. And this course provides students with um, research methodology, uh, Therefore, altogether, we provide a scientific education, uh, which is uh, evidence-based uh, for their design proposals. Uh, so uh, we have been focusing on Dutch regions uh, for this course. And in the past three years, we have been collaborating with the, mainly the province of South Holland. And the theme of the course is to uh, develop spatial strategies that can stimulate the transition towards a circular economy. Uh, and the last rounds, we focused more on the port of uh, Rotterdam. Therefore, we have worked uh, uh, in close collaboration with the province and the port authority. Uh, Helmut himself is part of this uh, collaboration. And then because of the theme on um, circular economy, we also benefited uh, from the previous, uh, a previous research projects uh, funded by the EU Horizon 2020 framework. It's called the uh, Repair, uh, Resource man Management in Peri-Urban Areas, uh, Going Beyond Urban Metabolism. So this is led by, uh, coordinated by uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Alex Wendel, and we also benefited from the Port City Futures. Uh, it's also an ongoing research uh, project led by Pro Professor Carola Hein from the Delft side. It's a LDE uh, collaboration within the province. Um, I have listed the main uh, partners, the names uh, you can see from the slides, but in reality, we have also more than 10 studio tutors. They come from different sections of our urbanism department, covering uh, expertise from spatial planning, urban design, environmental technology, uh, and management of the built environment. We also have uh, transition managers from the province. They uh, provided us a very valuable input on uh, uh, sectors related to, for example, the uh, construction demolition sector, agriculture sector, and uh, manufacturing industries. And these are uh, all together, you can see we are having a very um, big team uh, supporting this uh, studio. So a uh, brief uh, snapshot of the assignments. Uh, students work on regional design, which is about uh, stimulating uh, the regional development towards a more sustainable future. Uh, so students are asked to develop a spatial vision and a strategy. They work in groups of uh, four to five students. Uh, the thematic focus includes, as I said, uh, circular economy, focusing on the port area in the last round. It includes three sub themes related to uh, energy transition and, and manufacturing industries and bio-based economy. And besides these uh, circular circularity themes, we also ask students to link this circular transition with the social transition uh, in this uh, maritime region. Uh, for example, uh, how this circular transition can provide 
jobs for people and then also uh, contribute to the construction of affordable housing and transformation of deprived uh, neighborhoods and also how to enhance the relations between the port and the city. And we specifically ask students to pay attention to the uh, social spatial justice to reduce in inequality. So this, as you can see, is a very integral approach. Um, so we emphasize a lot on sustainability in this studio, and we refer to the SDGs of the United Nations in, in the very beginning. Uh, students are aware of this, and these should be the goals they uh, try to achieve through, through their projects. So these goals need to be achieved through a transdisciplinary approach, meaning that we need to work across disciplines in the professional world, but also we need to work with uh, real societal partners and stakeholders. And uh, we recognize the global challenges uh, that's uh, brought by the tr development trends, for example, the economic globalization, migration, and the climate change. And, and students are aware that these challenges cannot be tackled only by cities or neighborhoods themselves within their boundaries. Well, the importance of the region needs to be considered. That's why we work on the design at the regional level. Uh, this is an example of a integrated approach um, that well, we need to balance the economic, social, and uh, environmental gains and losses through our spatial strategies. So to do so, we uh, have created a situated learning environment uh, in which students work on real societal challenges. So the assignment was not defined only by the teachers, but also in together with the societal partners. Students feel that they are not learning passively, but also actively contributing to societal debates. And uh, uh, they are part of this uh, team that creating solutions uh, for these regional challenges. And because of the nature of regional design, which uh, involves constant negotiation, negotiation amongst stakeholders in reality, in practice, uh, we ask students to work in teams in order to simulate such a, a collaborative effort. So they need to deal with these uh, conflicts in interest among themselves, firstly, and also understand what are the real interests from the stakeholders. And also we need uh, real data. Uh, so luckily we have the province providing us uh, the GIS data, for example and also constant feedback from uh, stakeholders and our societal partners. So this is an example of uh, the workshop we did with the data, GIS data from the province. Students used their advanced techniques uh, of GIS, not to re only analyze the geographic distribution of uh, population and uh, industries, uh, but also trying to understand the clusters and networks that are uh, existing in this region. It helps a lot to build up an evidence-based uh, narrative for their regional strategies. And also uh, within these two months of very intensive course, students on the one hand uh, are very busy with their studio work, uh, getting input from all other course elements. They also get inputs from our uh, societal partners, mainly from the beginning when they introduce the assignments, the context of the region, uh, and also organize workshops uh, on, for example, material flow analysis that is uh, needed for the understanding of a circular transition. Uh, also uh, at the midterm presentation and final presentation, students also are confronted by our uh, societal partners with the reality. So this provides a very good uh, uh, input for our students to, to uh, relate their projects with the real uh, reality in the region. 
And in the last few years, we had to deal with the COVID situation. Therefore, we organized the studio and the, these input moments, uh, mainly uh, online. But this didn't prevent us from having a very fruitful discussions. So these midterm and final presentations were turned into actual conferences like today, uh, when, when the societal partners, and our studio teachers and students, they can really um, enjoy the presentations of students and also have a debate on the approaches the students are proposing. Uh, so these have uh, led to very good results of students' work. So I don't have much time to introduce the details of the student work, but in general, we can uh, see that uh, students, although they are very young in their career development, uh, especially many of them didn't have any experiences in uh, regional scale, uh, but after two months of intensive uh, work, they all came up with very inspiring uh, spatial strategies. They not only looked into the spatial conditions of the region, uh, try to understand the future potentials, uh, but also lo really looked uh, into other disciplines. In our case, it's uh, circularity and try to propose a more circular model, which can be hosted by this uh, spatial structure of the region and to propose a more sustainable model. For example, this is an example from a student group. Uh, they developed a strategy with a title called Down to Earth. They uh, propose to have a regenerative soil as the base for innovative solutions, uh, innovative bio-based region that can restore its eco ecological system while at the same time maintain its um, economic prosperity and also serve the majority of people living in the region uh, in terms of job and housing uh, accessibility. So we are very happy to see such uh, uh, strong propos proposals that uh, really helps us even to understand uh, the typology of the soils that we have in this region and how to uh, uh, develop our, our region following principles, uh, including nature-based solutions, um, biosensitive uh, development, and also how to create um, areas that produce clean energies uh, based on the soil conditions to release uh, the pressure um, from the massive uh, demand of uh, urban development. And students also, they not only making uh, a blueprint, they are not making a blueprint planning uh, for a fixed uh, time, but they looked through the process of development. They looked into the future and imagined how the region can be transformed spatially and how this uh, ecological system can be restored gradually while at the same time, we restructure the built up area in such a way that it can be more uh, sustainable. They also looked into the governance model, um, paid attention to uh, the collaboration among all types of stakeholders, including government uh, state, uh, companies and local residents, and see how real networks can be created. They also uh, positioned their uh, strategy within the existing policy frameworks through scales, for example, the, at the EU level, the European Green Deal, and also the SDGs, as I mentioned in the beginning, they even showed this uh, wedding cake uh, to see how uh, their different SDGs can be connected uh, through their projects. So uh, our ambition is not to uh, let these student works to be implemented immediately in this uh, region, but rather uh, let them join the societal debates on uh, this uh, discussion on how can we transform uh, the, our regions into a more circular region, which uh, will be more sustainable than the current model. And in order to 
facilitates such an uh, impact, uh, we try to disseminate our student work through various uh, medias, medium, medias, yeah. Since last year, we created this online exhibition, uh, which links these summaries of projects into the full uh, reports of each group. Uh, and these reports are uploaded in, in the TU Delft repository, uh, which is uh, open access. Uh, students uh, showed this internet, uh, uh, online exhibition through their social media and generated a lot of uh, views and, and likes. We also introduced this studio in our TU Delft uh, stories. And last year, it turns out to, to be one of the top 10 uh, read uh, stories, uh, which helps a lot with the um, dissemination of student work. So this answers my uh, question in the beginning. I hope that it can bring uh, some inspirations on how university studios can play a role in, uh, in this regional debate on sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you so much, Le. Of course, uh, I think it's quite a complete presentation. Uh, thank you for the overview. We really are running out of time, so I'll quickly move to the next presentation. And if there are some questions coming in, I would request you to drop your message in the chat box. Um, so, as a next uh, presentation, I would like to uh, invite uh, Benjamin Vossen, uh, Cecilia Shiapini, and uh, uh, Halina Zarate. Uh, all three of them will be talking about how research and practice are related and how the practice is making str uh, more taking more inspirations from the research that is happening in variety of universities. So I would uh, like to dive in directly to the presentation. Benjamin, the floor is yours. Uh, let's try to keep it as short as possible, as you have seen that we are running out of time, but uh, yeah, I, I have a nice presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. I will try to uh, shorten my presentation um, a little bit, <clears throat> but I also struggled yesterday putting it together, um, explaining the whole process that we are uh, can, currently undergoing in uh, only 10 minutes, but, I, but I'll try. Um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> see. Okay. Um, yeah, um, my name is Benjamin Fossner. I'm spatial and urban planner uh, and lead pro project manager uh, for the Revierknoten Raum project uh, at the RWTH University, which is uh, working on behalf of the region of the Rheinische Zurier, the um, metropolitan uh, Rhineland uh, mining area, uh, on one of the six identified topics of structural change um, in the Rhineland. And um, today I want to give you um, a small insight into our process developing a spatial vision uh, for, this, for this area. And even though my um, working uh, on a, uh, on the, from the university, my perspective is, is probably more on the practitioner side than uh, from the side of academia, but they're <clears throat> um, pretty much uh, intertwined in our, in our approach. See? Um, why are we dealing uh, with, uh, with this particular area and um, why do we think a new approach on planning is, uh, is, is necessary for, for our challenges ahead? Uh, in 2022, uh, the German government decided uh, to phase out uh, coal-fired power generation uh, throughout Germany uh, up until the year 2038 uh, in order to minimize um, yeah, the CO2 emissions in regard, uh, in also in, in regard of the uh, European climate change goals. Uh, and they then uh, therefore subsequently um, uh, made a support program of around about uh, 40 billion euros in total for all affected areas of structural change um, uh, on a national level. And currently the um, newly elected uh, German government is also uh, considering um, to move the uh, date um, of the phase out forward from uh, 2038 to 2030. Um, the, <clears throat> uh, the phase out uh, affects um, yeah, different coal mining regions in central and, and eastern Germany, but also in the Rhineland and northern, northern Rhine Westphalia, on uh, which our work is focused. 
Um, the Rhineland mining area is on the one hand uh, located on the western edge of North, North, North Rhine-Westphalia in direct independence with uh, Belgium and the Netherlands and on the other hand with the metropolises uh, Cologne, Bonn and Düsseldorf along the Rhine. Um, the uh, area is consisting of around about uh, 54 munici municipalities, including um, major cities like Aachen, Mönchen, Gladbach, and also smaller, uh, smaller cities like Euskirchen, Jülich, and Düren, where a lot of um, um, universities and um, development is also happening. Uh, up until last year, um, five, uh, we had five active uh, power plants in the region. In 2021, uh, the first uh, plant, uh, Frimmersdorf, uh, which you see on the western side of the region, um, already went off the grid. And um, we have also um, those uh, three uh, big open cast mining areas in the region in Hambach and Garzweiler. And just to get a grasp on, on, on how big the impact uh, of, of, of mining is and has been in the last decades in our region, um, I can show you. Uh, Hambach, uh, the mining pit of Hambach, uh, which is the biggest one, has a depth of uh, for about uh, 460 meters, and the combined size uh, of just the pits, uh, not the infrastructure and the, the, the electricities, um, is around uh, 9,000 hectares, um, or more, more than half of the city of Aachen. Um, in the past uh, decades, uh, as I said, the Mining had a huge uh, impact at first, uh, hardcore mining, then lignite mining, and have uh, strongly shaped uh, the development of the region. As you can here uh, see on the example, each red dot uh, is a former village that had to be moved uh, in order uh, in order to make uh, space during the mining process of the last decades. So the, all, uh, the early coal phase out confronts the region with uh, naturally major economic, but also uh, with spatial tests tax, of transformation on which we focus in our work. And from a spatial point of view, it is uh, mainly a question of the subsequent use of uh, subsequent use of the open cast mining holes and power plants and their associated infrastructure. Um, the open cast mining holes are uh, to be filled uh, with water uh, in the coming upcoming years up until uh, 2080, and shall then become one of the largest water bodies in, uh, in North Rhine Westphalia. Um, in addition, um, the region uh, has uh, set the goal of becoming a pioneer in implementing the goals of the European Green Deal, um, and is therefore, um, therefore reconstruction of the energy, energy system, a more efficient mobility system, and a sustainable remodeling of commercial, industrial, and residential sites but also the strengthening of um, open space and landscape, as well as uh, the improvement of climate resistance have a high importance for the regional uh, development and also for the funding, which is currently going on uh, in the region. Um, one of the major challenges um, in, in, in our region compared uh, to the, the other regions uh, in Germany, which are also, um, uh, which are also phasing out of, of, of coal mining um, is the, the availability of uh, for areas for the further development. Here in red, you see um, the, the restricted areas or the, the areas with a, with a really high um, uh, open space quality, um, like national parks, uh, Landschaftsschutzgebiete in, in German, but also, um, but also uh, the floodplains. And due to the value added losses caused by the fa uh, fade out, the natural uh, reflex, especially in the political arena, is to develop new commercial areas or residential areas. And also, um, there's a high pressure uh, on the housing market uh, due, due to the uh, metropolitan areas uh, in, the, in the west of the, of the region. So there's a, there's a really high competition, high level of competition for the few available areas uh, that are left. And um, when you even look at the, um, the high quality soils that are um, yeah, one of the best in, in, in Germany, there's just not, uh, just not much uh, space left for large scale development. 
And this is really uh, one of the main differences compared to the other mining reasons. So in our opinion, it is uh, necessary to develop small scale and so sustainable solutions, and also um, to identify the best solutions for the little space available. Let's see, so for, um, and for many problems um, as described as already said in, 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 the, others, uh, in the other presentations, um, a lot of the problems can uh, not longer solely be solved on a municipal level, um, and in order to achieve the ambitious goals uh, the region has uh, set for itself, in our opinion, a new approach of planning uh, to planning is, a, uh, is required. And uh, this is where we see a lot of potential um, for our informal regional approach, our spatial um, strategy for, for the region um, of the Rheinische Revier. Um, as I said, um, the uh, the region, um, in order to um, yeah to to face the the challenges uh, of the structural change, uh, needs targeted and bundled efforts to successfully manage this this change, um, and therefore a very convincing and ambitious path for the future is uh, is needed, um, and also. We think that uh, for a viable vision, um, a high level uh, of acceptance is necessary, especially since we are um, working on an informal level. And um, so the, um, the our plans can only be developed transparently and in close dialogue uh, with the local and regional um, stakeholders. And this is also already an experience that we made in the in the in the last month. Um, we, um, due to the high dynamics of the structural change and the complexity. Of the challenges ahead, um, it is really necessary to have an adaptable and dynamic planning process. Um, also, um, which is all very important in our in our minds uh, to motivate for the challenges ahead. This is um, in order to to um, yeah not only show the long term long term uh, objective. This is also necessary to uh, show uh, visible signs of change in the short and medium term. Um, the goals, and just uh, will just uh, say the main the main ones um, is um, to do um, develop a spatial analysis of the region, which uh, we we did in a, in our first year, and uh, we want to incorporate um, the different uh, incorporate and, and, and transfer the different project and processes and plans um, that are on smaller scales or on, on specific topics to the region into the regional context. Um, and the most important one is probably um, that we want to develop a common uh, programmatic and spatial object objective and development guidelines uh, for the region. Uh, and the thing which is which was very important up until now in our process um, is um, to show and uh, to show the, the local and regional stakeholders comprehensible and uh, communicable um, images to, to convey the upcoming transformation task and the vision for the future. Uh, in short, our process is divided in four phases. As I already said, we in the first year we conducted a um, yeah analysis of the region status quo, uh, including uh, different uh, topics: mobility, settlement, open space, economy. Um, but we also evaluated um, a number of um, um, previous works and uh, existing plans of the region, and tried to integrate them in our vision. Um, the phases one, uh, two, three um, are in um, designed in a in a format of a corporate, cooperative uh, planning workshop, and are accompanied by um, interdisciplinary planning teams, urban planners, landscape planners, and mobility planners. Um, and um, by choice, we we um, didn't want to hold a competition with only one winner who had the best vision for for the region, but uh, we wanted to promote uh, cooperation and exchange between the teams. And the aim, of, the aim of the assignment was to gather as wide as a range uh, as possible for a basis uh, for discussion uh, for the regional stakeholders so that they um, had, a, had a basis to, to decide for themselves what would be the, the right way uh, to move forward. Um, yeah, uh, in the first phase, we de developed um, um, yeah, plans on the regional scale with different time stages, 2030, 2050, 2070, since the um yeah the realization of these of these uh, lake sites uh, will take up to, up until then 
in um, the phase two, which I will show uh, some pictures and uh, results uh, later on, um, we uh, further ele elaborated um, special topics, but also uh, moved a little bit down in scale um, yeah, to ground and um, yeah, to, to have a more detailed um, uh, picture of, of the upcoming um, results. And in the, in the phase three, the, the, the merging phase we are currently in, we are conducting a major discussion on the results of the cooperative uh, planning workshop um, with regional stakeholders and are working together with uh, planning teams to, uh, with the planning teams to consolidate the, uh, the three results into a single concept. Um, maybe just in short, um, the um, development process is closely accompanied by, the, by regional stakeholders. Uh, this took very uh, took a very long time, but um, it was pretty exhausting. But I think uh, it was the the right choice uh, to, um, yeah, um, to to monitor this process or to discuss this process with the with the regional uh, stakeholders. Um, and we uh, therefore we de uh, developed uh, steering groups consisting of um, yeah so regional stakeholders from various ad administrative levels, the state ministry, district administration. Um, and so on. Um, and maybe just uh, uh, two more slides. Um, uh, we're closely uh, working together with our students on, on the different topics here on the uh, example of uh, a new city or the uh, subsequent use of um, yeah, uh, the electricity works. And um, yeah, you can find our um, main uh, results of the, of the project on our homepage. Um, I think uh, I, I pretty much uh, took all my time, uh, but if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask uh, as it is. Thank you so much, uh, Benjamin. Uh, I think um, it was really a good process to look at. It would be great if you can share some, uh, some, uh, some links on the chat box where the students yeah. can learn more. Thank Certainly. you. Uh, Halina, can you come in? And can you try to be in five minutes? Yes, I'll do, I'll do yes. my best. And I know that walking has well. quite a lot of content that can be shown in the chat box as well. So let's try and use that uh, more. Yes, for sure. Um, I'll share my screen. And apologies for the scratchy voice. <laughs> do you see? A full yes, screen? It's perfect. Okay, so, um, well, hello everyone. <laughs> My name is Alina. Thank you, Alankrita, for organizing. I'll try to be super fast. Today, I'll share with you a little bit about um, the Walk In project, which is um, a, a project that I'm involved through my PhD in TU Delft. So, um, the project leader of this initiative is Manuela Trigianese who is an assistant professor at TU Delft and also the co-promoter of my doctoral studies. So uh, this, this project was uh, uh, is then led by TU Delft, but it's also sponsored by NVO. And uh, it all started uh, to address the fact, uh, and you can see here a very big uh, scale change from all the projects that we've seen so far, but uh, here from in this morning, but uh, the idea was to look into the stations of uh, Rotterdam uh, or other cities that um, basically the, we identified the trouble, the problem that they're not yet meeting um, the new sustainable mobility requirements. They usually face problems like the lack of space for, for bikes or shared modes, as well as lack of open space or quality space for people and also for the urban programs. So this project, Walk-In walk -in project, it looks into how to make these transportation stations in this post-COVID situation still interesting places for people to go and places where everyone can enjoy to be at. So the idea is to explore how can mobility transition happen in a way that it fits all modes. Uh, it also um, 
helps to to fit the programs, the added programs in a seamless way, creating these inviting public spaces and and these attractive stations that prioritize prioritize people and help reduce the need for uh, cars. So with all of that, the proposal from this uh, research is to create a toolkit to make these attractive, sustainable uh, station areas. Um, the research focuses not on the central stations, but actually on the, on the more um, secondary stations or peripheral stations, because they have not been the focus so much so far on the published um, research that we've found, but also um, they are pretty much on the spotlight to, to have a big role in hosting the population growth in the coming years. So they will become a very denser, uh, denser urbanized space uh, around the stations are areas that are gonna change or are gonna transform a lot on the very near future. So this project involves a consortium of designers uh, as you can see here in this scheme, like uh, we have design partners like Delta Metropole, but also the Zwarte Hon, the Meccan, Oposad Matswan. And at the same time, we also have advisors. And the idea is to have everyone collaborate to, uh, to create that toolkit, that, that uh, toolbox that we were talking about. So the main activities from this project involve bringing those partners, those practitioners in, uh, into the uh, research and academic um, environment, uh, through, involve them through workshops, um, but also bring them to, the, to, the, to courses to, to do research by design and education. And actually we, we hosted a course called City of Innovations, which is a master's one course in the Faculty of, of Architecture and Built Environment in TU Delft that could benefit from this collaboration with this, uh, with this practitioners and this network. So also through the walk-in project, it was possible to host lectures. Uh, there will be a symposium at the end. And these are all moments for networking and, and promoting the collaboration and the contact between these different, um, these different domains. So the idea of this collaboration is to create a definition of what is the walk-in station, but also a methodology that can help the both practitioners, but also students to understand how you can uh, design these places, what tools can you use uh, to design such places? And how can that be a model that instigates the debate between them? So this collaboration between them. So uh, ultimately the, the project is also contributing also to strengthening this collaboration between the, the different um, professionals or, or researchers interested in doing research by design. Uh, the, the output that is envisioned is a, is a publication which would um, show and feature this design toolkit. And uh, as you can see in this uh, scheme, this project will run for one year. It started in February last year. And here uh, in this little box, you, you highlight, I'm highlighting work package one, which was the one that we started, which has uh, education as one of the core parts. Of, of this first step that we took. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the education part and how, um, how this collaboration happened. So as I mentioned, uh, this first work pa package, that it includes the involvement of this master class, this master students from City of Innovations course in TU Delft. And um, my involvement with the course was as a teacher assistant. And I was accompanying through my PhD I was a company, Manuela Trigianese, but also Young Zhang, which was the coordinator of the studio, and Yas Soilev, which is a, a tutor on the studio, but also a research for walking. And the, the course adopted uh, the case studies on, in Rotterdam Zoud, like stations, metro stations in Rotterdam Zoud, because uh, they are on the project scope of walking, but they are also 
the sites that I will be researching on my PhD. So uh, the idea was that um, looking into these stations would help us to understand the larger network uh, in Rotterdam that is uh, focused to be a place like Rotterdam is facing a really big challenge. They are going to grow 50,000 people by 2040 and they have to place this population growth somewhere. And these are stations that are a, a focus for, for hosting this population growth. But there are also stations that are facing uh, considerable socioeconomic strain uh, and having this urban transformation so fast in such a place brings in many, many challenges, as you can imagine. So uh, through the course, uh, I could share some initial investigations that I started from the research uh, side in terms of uh, initial urban analysis, inventorization, uh, looking into plans and policies that are already there, but also site observations. And from here, the students can, could take this and uh, bring their own steps, take it further and understand what's needed for their analysis in when they are elaborating design proposals for these three station areas. And at the same time, as I mentioned, we have these lecturers coming, coming from multiple backgrounds uh, to, to talk to the students and share how do they do it in their creative process? You know, like what, for instance, we had Nassima coming from uh, Gustave Eiffel in Paris, talking about Grand Paris as Express as a, as a experience. We had Chai from Desvarte Hond sharing the design principles for station areas, uh, Mecano sharing the, the journey of the future, and Miguel Los sharing also uh, their own toolkits from uh, Budos Po Baromeister on the new station districts. This was very valuable. These were resources that the students could use into elaborating proposals, design proposals later on. So uh, uh, one really interesting activity that we had was uh, the, the student stakeholder hope role play, which uh, I found it very interesting to hear from Sandra in the beginning this idea of like, oh, how can we talk about SDGs and different interests and then find a middle ground that promotes interrelations and collaborations. And also later on, I think uh, Lei mentioned uh, the same, like this idea that students should collaborate from different perspectives and points of view to learn how this negotiation um, happens actually in practice, which is something that you always have to deal with in finding design solutions that are uh, common, but at the same time, uh, don't ruin other, others' interests, right? Um, so the design process allowed uh, the students to look into uh, urban analysis, but also interpret the challenges and potentials for the area, define what would be the design criteria and the tools that they would use. And then from there, they could generate multiple scenarios because you don't have only one answer for, for the problem that you have in hand, but many things can come out of combining different principles and criteria that all serve to, to those interests. Uh, so what, like to finalize uh, this part, uh, the output that came out was were these several visions on how these stations and stations area areas could transform and adapt for this future mobility, these future programs, this quality living that we are envisioning. And um, as an output, it will, there will be a publication similar to the other books that were published in different editions, previous editions of this course. And this one will come out soon. Um, we will let you know when it's out. So thank you very much. I hope it was, I, I tried to make it as fast as possible. <laughs> Any questions you can, about the content, you can ask Manuela and about the research proposal, you can reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alina. I think it's a shout out to the, all the participants. If there are any questions for these presentations, we are going very fast now. So if there are any questions, please put it on the chat box and we can always send some questions later to the speakers as well.
Thank you, Helena, so much. Uh, it was it's a really interesting project, uh, and we look forward to continue working with you on this. Uh, Thank you. Cecilia Shiapinish, can I call you in for the last presentation and then we go for a coffee break? Yes, you can. <laughs> Great. Hello, everybody. I'll jump directly into it. Uh, I think you can see it, right? Yes, it's visible. Thank okay, you so much. Well, thank you. Um, I call this presentation Borders Under Hypertransformation, which is uh, a design studio we're currently leading with my colleague Caroline Jutton at KU Leuven of which many of our students are participating in this symposium and especially in this working session. So I'm really addressing them. I'm addressing people that will be working, working out uh, these coming two days. But I do want to place it within a broader interaction between academia practice, uh, because I'm experiencing myself through the different commitments I have at Kyle Leuven as a researcher, teacher, and also heading a master in urbanism at FOMTIS. Um, let me start with a, a brief introduction. I'm an architect. I'm an architect that broadened up also into urban design. I studied in Argentina, then in Switzerland. I did my PhD in architecture at KU Leuven, but on urban transformations and how um, the relationship between infrastructure when it's under transformation can alter and generate opportunities for spatial relationships. And this I like to always uh, uh, emerge, uh, uh, merge with practice. And I've worked in, in um, practice and I currently have my own uh, practice in which I really look uh, at these uh, larger, larger tensions or larger fluxes uh, that can have a very great impact on local conditions um, around infrastructure, transformation, urban spaces. Um, the, this is some examples of uh, design studios that had uh, been taking place in Buenos Aires, uh, developed in Brussels, presented in other exhibitions in Europe, and we do that uh, also the other way around. Um, and this is my provocation. Let's look at urban and territorial space from the three basic uh, qualities or dimensions that we are a bit familiar with that this is something that is politically embedded, it is something that is material, but it's also something that is very interceptive where relations happen. And what I've done is uh, articulated this into an approach uh, to study, to research and design urban and territorial spaces uh, around these three uh, notions, expectations, uh, meaning what do we imagine? Uh, what are the narratives, the hopes, the projects we, we reflect and produce on urban space? Materialization is, okay, what are the physicalities? What is actually there in terms of material, space, etc.? And in appropriations, I, I would encourage you to look at what people do and how people relate, where they are, how, how they uh, act in space. Uh, this I would propose to always look in terms of interscalarity and intention. So this can be space scales, can be time scales, but also this relationship between what I call the central actors and the marginal actors regarding the mechanisms for implementing change in space. And when you look at these tensions, you start, uh, uh, I would say, reaching these intermediate con conditions, uh, which I call intertemporalities, interspatialities, and interterritorialities, which are basically broadening up our notions from Euclidean space, chronic time, and jurisdictional uh, territory. I have as an example what I uh, explore in depth at my PhD in Barcelona, uh, like a big worldwide paradigm, which in this area of Glorias has demolished, built and demolished three generations of infrastructures. Why? Because paradigms are changing, are being questioned. So this also brings in some level of caution, uh, caution we need to, to have regarding what we think needs to be done or happen in space. So in this session, we will work out, like in the gym, some uh, uh, skills and some muscles. And I would first say, let's look at context. Uh, context in the sense of those uh, qualities or, or frames that are more stable. Uh, and those are on the other extreme, more fluctuant, more changing, more under threat. And look also at those in which both conditions uh, 
merge the hybrid and of course you will have different uh, design strategies uh, if you're working in such a condition or in a very stable neighborhood in the Netherlands or in, in Germany but Europe and this mega region is full of this folding hybrid um, uh, frames in which we can really uh, uh, find uh, entry doors. The other uh, is uh, okay the skills for performing on site when you can be really there but also daring and now we're more used to work uh, remotely and also mix uh, this and these are some examples of how we, we trigger our, our students to, to engage with different uh, sites and locations and resources for thinking, researching and designing these areas and also scales. Scales, not small, medium, large, but micro, multi uh, and intermediate. And for this, I will show three examples, and they had to do with architecture, architecture that can have this prototypical character. Um, for example, here as a provocation, the student there to merge the sizes, the shapes, the morphologies of a high-end business center in Brussels with the micro grain of popular neighborhoods and create a typology, architectural typology that has a saying in, in the debate. Also, another student worked on uh, um, uh, the interfaces, let's say, between the large infrastructure and the uh, surrounding urban areas on what I would call altered urban interfaces and generating new qualities of space. This can also be understood or explored at territorial scale, so what they call the territorial transitions, in which you can look at how cities and nat nature and culture would interact. Um, and broadening up to what I call the territorial relationships. And these are current work of our current students that are present here today, in which we can think of these terms um, from a very general to a very concrete implementation that is cross-border and that has uh, a meaning and impact uh, on, 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 on practice, academia and, and, and research. And we can also take some of these concepts uh, and make them operational like rhythms and then check the disruptive relations between stations, fluxes, local conditions and turn them into tools, tools that can also be provocative like some of the students that are also here today work on this board that can help you imagine in alternative development uh, uh, scenarios. So basically I would just finish with saying use design um, as an exploration, as an experiential tool in which you can position yourself regarding scenarios and vision, and basically then uh, go into trying, trying it out so we can uh, have more of these moments and, and most of all, uh, have fun uh, the coming hours. And thank you very much. <laughs> I think I stayed thank within five so minutes much, or so. <laughs> yes, no, definitely. It was very crisp and strong message. So that was really mm. great and super interesting project. Uh, I think all the three projects show somehow the different skills and the different way of working. Uh, so thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, Paul, how do we finalize this session? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's very good to have this overview because I think this is really very interesting to share also the types of research that are being done within the Euro Delta. And I think perhaps we should even uh, make it a separate, whole separate meeting of presenting to each other the different kinds of approaches because I find it very inspiring, uh, particularly when we focus on what comes out of that or the kind of struggles you uh, come up with. So Cecilia, thank you very much for that uh, kind of insight. Um, and I think it's uh, really an inspiration for all of the um, participants also uh, for this afternoon. I'm afraid we will we don't have time anymore to to come uh, come back to questions in the chat or or uh, other uh, discussions. So um, we have to uh, wrap up now and uh, and give some space for a coffee so that we can then really um, start with the real work for the next generation. So after the coffee break, uh, Alan Gita will, uh, will be back to uh, inform everyone who is participating uh, in the workshop to um, like, how are we going to approach it? And, um, and then uh, we take it from there. So I think Alan Gita, that's, uh, that's it for the, for the morning now.
Yes, uh, thank you so much everyone for joining. Thank you all the speakers, contributors, and we hope to see you uh, again tomorrow at three o'clock for the closing ceremony. Yes, and this is uh, we are still in the in the in the um, plenary uh, discussion, aren't yes. we? This is not yes, yes. Of course. The plenary would be 